that means that we can have the lights off now, starting right now. History, we decided, <laughs> you decided along with me last time, history is the use that the present makes of the past. In order to do that, you start with events of sufficient interest, import, or magnitude that they are recorded by somebody and then can be transformed by some literate person into a written accord, a written record that, that illuminates and enlarges the present. The cataclysmic event that begins, that ends the previous period and is the beginning of the period that we're about to start are the Babylonian conquests of the early 7th, of the late 7th and early 6th centuries BCE. Babylon is the southern Mesopotamian power, Assyria the northern Mesopotamian power. So this entire region had been uh, under Assyria with the capital at Nineveh. The Babylonians take Nineveh in the year 612 and very shortly thereafter in the year 609 the Babylonian kings begin a series of campaigns up the Euphrates down the Levantine coast and into uh, Phoenicia, Philistia, and finally and ultimately Judah, um, the final campaign of the Babylonian kings, that of Nebuchadrezzar, usually known by those of you that um, had Bible study 101 in Sunday school as Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but now we know that we have been mis mistranslating his name and that N is really an R, so it's Nebuchadrezzar. Um, in 599 to 586. The swath of destruction is evident at sites both in Philistia and in Judah. So this is Ashkelon, uh, Jerusalem. Two and a half meters of destruction fill cover the slopes of the city of David in Jerusalem. Uh, unlike the Assyrian conquests, the Babylonian conquests leave more and more widespread evidence of destruction. The Assyrians claim to have done significant widespread damage. The Babylonians don't record as much about the damage, but there's a lot more material evidence on the ground for it. Uh, these events are recorded in a variety of texts in the Hebrew Bible. The end of the book of 2 Kings. Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, in the old translation, King of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and to all the homes of Jerusalem, even Every great home he burned with fire. The temple, the house of the Lord, of course, is the temple. That is the first temple in Jerusalem. That's the temple that Solomon builds here on the Temple Mount. And with this destruction comes an end to the biblical period that is normally called the first temple period. That's the end of the first temple period. The first temple period encompasses all of the Iron Age, Iron 2A, B, and C. Those are the archaeological designations for the biblical stretch of time that we call the first temple period. Um, the prophetic book of Jeremiah, also Jeremiah was uh, somebody alive and living in Jerusalem at the time of the conquest, and he records uh, the precise events that are also recorded in 2 Kings. In the 10th month of the ninth year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Nebuchadrezzar advanced with all his army against Jerusalem. They laid siege to it. In the fourth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, on the ninth day of the month, the city was thrown open. All the officers of the king of Babylon came in and took their seats in the middle gate. 
How do we know exactly what date this is? Because we can know precisely which date the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar slash Nebuchadnezzar was because there's an astronomical tablet from Babylon that records uh, uh, astronomical events, some of which can be dated. And there is one that records a series of uh, constellations that had to have been aligned in a certain way um, in the year 568, 567, and that, according to the tablet that records them, was, I, you see, I had to write this down. This was way too many numbers for me to remember. <laughs> that was in the 37th year of Nebuchadnezzar. And so if you just, if you know then that the 37th year of Nebuchadnezzar is 568, 567, then the 19th year, which is the one that's recorded in Jeremiah and Second Kings, has to be 586. Uh, the fifth month is uh, the month of Av, and it, lasts, and it lasted in that year from what we would know of as the 8th of August to the 6th of September. And so we know the, the month and the day on which the city was destroyed. In the biblical book of Psalms, the event is referred to not as um, objective it happened on this day and this per by this person, but as a uh, universal cataclysm. Psalm 79, O God, the heathen has set foot in thy domain, defiled thy holy temple, and laid Jerusalem in ruins. Their blood is spilled all around Jerusalem like water. Arise and have mercy on Zion, for the time has come to pity her. Her very stones are dear to thy servants, and even her dust moves them with pity. Psalm 122. Now we stand within your gates, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem that is built to be a city where people come together in unity. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So the exiles... Philistines, Judeans, Phoenicians, remaining Israelites are taken to Babylon and the towns around. And they remain there until salvation comes in the form of another conqueror. This time a conqueror from further east who comes to Babylon, this great city, on the Tigris in southern Mesopotamia. You see an aerial view here of part of the city of Babylon, the foundations of the great ziggurat, the temple of Marduk, the main religious edifice in the city, and the, the high podium at the top of which the temple stood, the giant staircase that led up to the temple, the great bridge across the river and the monumental gates that led into the city. Of all of the monumental gates, um, oh, I forgot that I was going to show you this guy. I'm showing you this only because you need to know about Nabonidus for Steve Weitzman's JBL article that you will all read and enjoy called Plotting Antiochus's Persecution. Um, he is in that article making a literary link between the story in the book of 1 Maccabees that we'll be getting to uh, in about three lectures from now, um, and uh, events in conjunction with this king, Nabonidus, the last king of Babylon. This is the man, 556 to about 530, who was in place uh, as the king of Babylon when uh, this, new, this new conqueror comes to the city. And like m most of the Babylonian kings, and as you'll see shortly, subsequent kings as well, his deeds were recorded in cuneiform on these very weird, interesting objects that are called cylinders for obvious reasons. <laughs> no, no problem figuring that one out. And, uh, and these cylinders are, are made out of clay, and then into the wet clay, the the deeds of the king are, are recorded. 
So uh, it's, the, it's the deeds of Nabonidus is recorded on, on a cylinder such as this that, that Steve uh, invokes in the article that you will be reading. The most famous of the gates of Babylon is this one, the Ishtar Gate, um, which I can't resist showing you because it's so amazing. And you can go see it. You don't have to travel, thank goodness, at the moment to Babylon, which you couldn't even if you wanted to. Uh, all you have to do is go to Berlin, where um, the gate was taken by German archaeologists in the 19th century after they dug it up. Believe it or not, the entire thing. And here it is. Um, so you can go to the Pergamon Museum in what used to be East Berlin, but is now Berlin. Um, and, and see its monumentalness. It's just fantastic. It has, it's uh, decorated with or covered with uh, glazed tiles, each one of these tiles colored and the colored tiles forming a procession of, of animals of um, either mystical or real uh, animals. Some are, there are lions and um, dragons and and all kinds of fantastic things. So uh, here's a reconstruction drawing of uh, the Ishtar Gate. And it is to Babylon in about the year 530 that uh, a man named Cyrus, uh, who has collected all of the um, tribes of the Medes, the Elamites, and the Persians, all the people who live in what is today modern-day Iran, to the east of Mesopotamia, and he, too, records his great deeds on a cylinder called the Cyrus Cylinder. Um, there's actually more than one Cyrus Cylinder. This one happens to be the one that's in the British Museum. Uh, and on the Cyrus Cylinder, uh, we can see how Cyrus characterizes his conquest of the Babylonians, who, of course, had been the people who, in turn, had conquered the Assyrians. So it's just a wave of conquering imperial presences in the East. Um, and Cyrus says, when a low person was put in charge of his country, and by this he means Nabonidus, he made a counterfeit of Isagil, that's one of the gods, and the rest of the cult cities, rights inappropriate to them, impure food offerings, disrespectful and intolerably. Intoler he brought the daily offerings to a halt. He interfered with the rites and instituted within the sanctuaries. Reverential fear of Marduk, king of the gods, came to an end. He did yet more evil to his city every day. There is, a, the reason that I have this up here, this is, um, this is the exact same pattern that Nabonidus records in his cylinder. I took over, and it was a good thing I did, because the gods were not being appropriately honored, and I have taken care of that. And that's exactly what Cyrus says as his explanation of what is going on. And as you'll see when you read Steve's article, of course, that's exactly what um, Judah Maccabee says he's doing when he restores rights in the temple in Jerusalem when we get down to the second century BCE. So because uh, uh, the gods were displeased because their rights had been halted, the main god of Babylon, Marduk, according to Cyrus, inspected and checked all the countries seeking for the upright king of his choice. He took under his hand Cyrus, king of the city of Anshan, and called him by his name, proclaiming him aloud for the kingship over all of everything. There is no king worth his salt in this part of the world who is not favored by a patron deity. Marduk, the great lord who nurtures his people, saw with pleasure his fine deeds, his being Cyrus, and true heart, and ordered that he should go to his, that is Marduk's, city, Babylon. This is my favorite part of the Cyrus Cylinder. I love this so much. No, no other text from Assyria or, Mes or, or Babylon does this. Like a friend and companion, he walked at his side, with Marduk and Cyrus, hand in hand. <laughs> his, that is Cyrus's, vast troops, whose number, like the water in a river, could not be counted, marched fully armed at his side. He had him enter without fighting or battle. And then the by now expected proclamation, I am Cyrus, king of the universe. Who, who is that guy who got the Academy Award and said that? The director of Titanic? James Cameron. What, isn't that what he said? I'm king of the universe. I'm king of, king of the world. King of the world. 
<laughs> he needed the rest of this script. <laughs> king of the universe, the great king, the powerful king, king of Babylon, Sumer, and Akkad, king of the four quarters of the world, the great king, whose reign Bel and Nabu love, and with whose kingship, to their joy, they concern themselves. So this was, yes, sir? It, meaning what, sorry? No, they mean companion like friend. Just, just a good friend. Like buddies. Well, well, we're translating from, you know, the Aramaic, the cuneiform Aramaic here. And they, it, it's, it's buddy. This is like a buddy movie. Marduk and Cyrus. <laughs> Together at last. <laughs> and entering Babylon. So here is the ex a road trip, right? So here's the extent. Uh, so so uh, Cyrus, incidentally, comes from this area over here. The Medes are part of the group of people that Cyrus was uh, the, the, the king of. Um, on this flat, featureless, almost completely featureless map, you cannot see the mountain range that's here. There's actually mountains here that separate um, Mesopotamia from the Iranian plateau. This is the Iranian plateau. So uh, modern-day Iran, of course, modern-day Iraq, but, but there are these mountains in the middle, the Zagros Mountains. Uh, so here you have the empire of the Babylonians um, from 612, when Nineveh is conquered, down to about 530, not even a full century. And here the extent within 20 years of the conquest of Cyrus of the next empire to control this part of the world. And that is the empire of the Persians, the Achaemenid Persians, um, who's, who's ha the heartland of uh, their, their occupation is this region of southern Iran. And here is, their, is the capital city that is built uh, to now replace Khorsabad and Nimrud and Nineveh and Babylon. This is the new capital city of the Near East, Persepolis, capital of the Achaemenid Persian Empire from the conquest of Cyrus in about 525 until the year 330, when yet another conqueror is going to be sweeping through, but we'll get to him probably in about a lecture and a half. So... Uh, Persepolis is, uh, is a kind of important place for us to just have a couple mentions of here because uh, some items and events that occur here have a direct impact on life in our part of the world in the, in the southern Levant. So you're looking here at, at uh, the main audience hall of the capital city of Persepolis. It's a building that's called the Apadana. And on this audience hall, you may make out here relief sculpture um, marking the stairways that you, can, that you can walk up. And here is a detail of what that relief sculpture looks like. You recall from that map that the Persian Empire is pretty vast. It extends from, actually, India in the east, all the way to the Aegean, and, and the northern Aegean, the area of Thrace, which is today part of northern Greece, and as far uh, in the west, in the, in the southern extent, to Egypt. So it's very huge, and it was divided for administrative purposes into governmental units that were called satrapies, S-A-T-R-A-P-I-E-S. And here on the Abadana in Persepolis, every satrapy is represented by a delegation of tribute-bearing members. So you see, and they're each separated by a, a very large leaf, which I think is supposed to be a tree. So, so here is a delegation, and here is a second delegation, and here's a third, and here's a fourth. And you see that they are all carrying objects or items in, in their hands. And they're all differentiated. Each satrapy is differentiated. They have different kinds of headgear, uh, different kinds of dress, 
These guys have short tunics and, and kind of knicker-like trousers. Um, and, and, the, and these folks have sort of loincloths, and these folks have long robes. So, so each one is differentiated by both attire and by their gifts. And the gifts represent the best or most luxurious or most important products of the satrapal region. So here, for example, is an Elamite from uh, Region 2, Satrapy 2. And he's bringing a lion cub. He's actually carrying a lion cub who looks real happy to be there. <laughs> Going to make the king happy. And uh, here's an Armenian. Uh, from Satrapi Area 7, and he's carrying a very fine, beautiful, what must have been gold or silver vase. And here are some of the Babylonians. Um, Babylon was the third of the satrapal units of the empire, and one of them is carrying a beautiful woven textile, and the other is carrying a special kind of bowl. He's carrying two of them. He's holding in his hands. So they must have a sort of rounded bottom, and he's holding them out in front of them. And Items, actual items that match up with the gifts on the tribute reliefs at Persepolis are known. So here, for example, is a bowl of the same sort that is being carried by the hands of the Babylonian delegate. And this uh, is, is a drawing of a bronze bowl that was found at Persepolis. And here is an amazing vase with animal pronged handles, which is very similar to the one that's being carried by the Armenian delegate here um, in, in the release. So here um, are the delegates from our satrapy. Our satrapy is uh, over the river, or it's sometimes called, sometimes translated as beyond the river. And the river, of course, is the Euphrates. So this is the satrapy that, from the point of view of the people in Persepolis, is on the other side of the Euphrates. And here is a picture of this delegation, the delegation from over the river. And you see that uh, the over the river delegates are holding also very fancy vases with animal pronged tops. And um, they're bringing a chariot with horses and some horse bridles or, or yokes. And the middle delegate is also carrying bowls of that same sort that the Babylonian delegate was carrying. Bowls of this sort are pretty common metal finds in um, the coastal areas of Palestine in this period, the period that I am now going to be calling the Persian period. That is the period when, under, when, during which this part of the world is under Achaemenid Persian rule. These sorts of bowls are so common that they have a name, and their name is Achaemenid bowls, Achaemenid for the Achaemenid Persians. Achaemenid bowls are bowls that have a rounded bottom and a carinated rim, and they are not identical one to another. So, you, so here's one that was actually recently excavated at a site um, near, near Jaffa, uh, south of Tel Aviv. And here is one with an inscription on it that was found actually with a group of others in a, in a cache that was probably a, a cult cache in the Sharon Plain, the area of the coastal plain that's called the Sharon Plain. And the inscription on it, which is in Aramaic, which was the lingua franca of the age, alphabetic Aramaic, reads to the Ashtars who are in Sharon. Who are the Ashtars? I bet that's what you're wondering. Who are the Ashtars? Uh, well, it's possible that the Ashtars are a group of female deities equated with Astarte, the old Astarte that is, um, that we know of from, from even from Canaanite times, from, from the Bronze Age. But it's also possible that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that specific deity because Ashtar is the Aramaic vocalization of the Akkadian word for goddesses, which is Ishtaru. And, and that just means any female goddesses. It, it actually means goddesses, just the fe a female deity. And so it's possible that what this bowl, the, the group to whom the bowl is dedicated are 
any female deities who happened to reside in the Sharon, the, this area that we know of today and was known then as well as, as the Sharon Plain. So these accounted bowls, these beautiful bronze and silver bowls, were um, cult items and also grave items. This was actually found in a grave. This is not found in a cult site. So it could have been these sorts of bowls were the most, the fanciest and the nicest items that somebody had, some wealthy person who was um, perhaps uh, uh, either a delegate to the Persian court at some point or connected with somebody who had something to do with the Persian court or just was allying himself with the cultural imprimatur of Persia at this time period. And uh, then when the person, is, when the person dies, uh, this goes with them as a grave gift. So grave gifts and also um, cult items, accommodated bowls. Um, all right, let's look at a couple sites from this period on the coast. We'll start with the site of Dor. Here in the, northern, in the northern coast, you see an aerial view of the site. This is actually the site here. Part of it has been eaten away uh, by erosion, so originally this, this was land. But there is also a natural harbor here. This is the harbor area of the site down here, and there's also a harbor area in here. There are actually harbor installations um, that, that have been found. In the Iron II period, this was part of Assyria. This part of the country had been conquered by the Assyrians in the 7th century. So the northern coastal plain was already part of Assyria. And in fact, a stele of, uh, of an Assyrian king, Esarhaddon, um, was found at the site. It must have been set up. This monumental stele must have been set up at, at Dor. You see the little bitty kings and, and governors and officials of Dor down here and the great king here. This is still kind of hilarious. <laughs> but what this reminds you is, you know, we talk, we, we, we punctuate and characterize life at any of these places by these military events. Now it's part of the Assyrian Empire, it's conquered, blah, blah, blah. And for most people, in most places, life just went on. It's not as if there was some cataclysmic annihilation at place after place. So at Dor, for example, we don't have big destruction deposits marking the beginning or the end of the Assyrian period, marking the beginning or the end of the Neo-Babylonian period. The site is not attacked. And instead, the people who live here, just, life just continues to go on. So, so uh, it was... Uh, a thriving port under the Assyrians, and then continued so uh, in the Neo-Babylonian period, and in the Persian period, um, really came into its own. So here is a plan of, of the town of Dor, and uh, you see the excavation areas here in, in red. And we're going to um, see remains from area D, down here, and also areas A and C up here in this part of the city. So A and C are up here, and D is right there. So up in area C, lots of houses. The houses are very interesting uh, for two reasons. No, maybe three reasons. One is that they're part of a kind of laid out plan, a sort of grid plan. Two, that plan is pretty early and it just continues. So the, it is as early as the Persian period and, and possibly earlier, these houses. And uh, you're looking here at some house walls and the house walls are, go very deep and, and were very high and the floor levels just kept rising. So the same walls continued in use, but the floor, you could do this if you are very messy, but you want to stay in your house. <laughs> just cover up that floor. Don't bother to pick anything up. Just tamp it down. 
<laughs> it's really helpful to have dirt floors, though. Without dirt floors, this is a little harder. Um, and solid roofs make it problematic, too. Pretty soon you don't have enough room. But anyway, so yeah, so they just kept building uh, fl floor levels up. And the third reason that these, that these house walls are interesting is for the kind of construction that they are. You see, uh, solid ashlar blocks all um, spread apart, forming a kind of vertical pier. It's not a monolithic pier. It's a built pier. And in between these piers uh, is smaller stones, sort of rubbly matrix, that connects and fills in the space between the piers. So this kind of construction has a name. You're going to be amazed at this name. Are you ready? It's called pier and rubble. <laughs> P-I-E-R. That's the kind of pier it is, not you know one-to-one -one sharing piers. P-I-E-R, pier and rubble. And pier and rubble construction is attested as early as the 10th century BC from Phoenicia, in the area of Tyre and Sidon. Why? Sort of a weird kind of construction. Why not just build a stone sockle and then a uh, mud brick wall? Well, they had a lot of stone in this area, and they also had a lot of rain. It's a wet area. It's near the coast. So walls made out of stone are much more practical than walls made out of mud brick. And they are going to last a lot longer. And in fact, these walls did last a long time. Why build them like this, though? This is a really weird way to build. Well, this entire region, actually, is somewhat earthquake prone, slightly unstable. It's not famously earthquake prone, like the San Andreas Fault. But there are earthquakes around here uh, every about 60 or 70 years. And if you have a wall that's built totally of rubble, it will just completely fall apart. And if you have a wall that's built totally of ashlers, it's very easy for, if one part of it goes, it will, the whole rest of it will go down with it. If one part of an interlocked set of ashlers goes, the interlocking system will mean that the entire wall will cascade down. But this sort of wall, a pier and rubble wall, the rubble will fall out, but the piers will stay intact, unless it's an enormous once every 500 years style of earthquake. So then it's pretty easy to rebuild. So it's a kind of earthquake friendly construction technique, pier and rubble, that is very old in this area that, um, is, uh, that is associated with uh, Phoenician construction and has, has continued to be associated with Phoenician um, with areas that are, that are uh, under Phoenician political hegemony. In the houses and around the houses, a fair number of figurines are found. Some of them were found in uh, these pits with lots and lots of figurines all thrown in at once. These things are called favisa. F-A-V-I-S-S-A-E. That's a, it's a sort of cult garbage pit. You can't really throw away items that, have, that are religious or been dedicated, or you don't want to do that. So you, you cache them in, in some sanctified spot, and, and such is a, is a Fabisa. So um, lots of these figurines are found in Fabisa, and uh, they are a recognizable... Um, type. They are these female deities that are either pregnant, having just had a child, um, as you can tell because they're holding the baby, or perhaps just having a child, as you can tell, because they're holding up their breasts. Now, of course, the subject of these figurines is very familiar uh, from much earlier Phoenician and Judean female figurines. The subject is no different. But the technique for making them is now completely different. These uh, are, the Judean figurines are made in, uh, on a wheel, and the heads are, are made in a, a mold that's in the round. And the, and the Phoenician Iron II figurines are made in a two-part mold. There's, the mold has, has a back and a front. But the 
Persian period figurines from Dor, and actually the Persian period figurines from elsewhere too, are now made in just a one-part mold. So you take some clay and you put it in this mold and then you flatten off the excess clay in the back so that the back has nothing on it at all. It's just this flat, undifferentiated mass of clay. This technique of making figurines in a one-part mold is Greek. So the idea for doing this comes from the Greek world and is borrowed here. And it is not just the technique that is Greek, but the style of the figurines now looks more Greek than Levantine. So you might compare, for example, the face and hair of this Judean pillar figurine from the Iron II period and this Persian period figurine from Dor. The proportions of the face and the hairstyle are more similar to contemporary Greek fertility and female figurines of the sorts that probably, if you come to Barbara's lecture next Thursday, you'll, you'll see some of. There are also men. There are the pantheon of deities being worshipped. Uh, includes uh, men as well as women. And a lot of heads were, have been found in various favisai at Dor. You see a whole clatch of them here, and here is one in detail. And again, the style of these, to have a, a male deity is not news, but, to, but the style of the, of the male heads now is like that of contemporary Greek figurines. So here, the head of uh, some unidentified male deity from Dor. Here, a little bronze figurine about six inches high from the sanctuary of Zeus at Dodona in northern Greece. Um, we know it's Zeus in part because he was found at a sanctuary of Zeus. But the reason that we really know it's Zeus, not because you can tell necessarily from the head, all these gods look alike. That's not just your imagination. They really do all look alike. <laughs> <laughs> They're sort of interchangeable that way. But uh, he's, this, this particular guy is holding a thunderbolt. And a thunderbolt is the um, emblem of Zeus. It's the attribute of Zeus. But you just need to uh, see the profile, the eye, the nose, the beard of this Zeus and look at this figure, who can't be Zeus because he's wearing some weird cap that Zeus never wears, um, uh, to see that we have here, uh, just as with the female figurines, the adoption of the same um, uh, style, uh, Greek style, for the this, in this case, the local male deity. Um, the folks at Dor had reason to come into ready contact with Greeks, um, either Greeks who were coming to the site or, or people from Dor going out, because they had a product that a lot of people wanted. And they were clearly exploiting this product. And that product was purple dye. Purple dye, naturally, is extruded from the shells of the murex snail. And here you see a whole bunch of murex shells. And dye pits with hundreds of crushed murex shells in and around them were found down here in area D, in Dor. When you crush a murex shell, this is what comes out, this purple stuff, very pretty. And if you've got some plain old sheep's wool, and you've spun it, and you dip it in a vat, this is the color that you get. You may recall that the name Phoenicia was given to this region by the Greeks because of the name purple, Phoenix purple. Yeah? I'm just wondering about the other slide. Um, when did the adoption of the Greek sculpture the, arise? This style, the, the, these styles, in, this, in, the, in the Persian period. I mean, this, so this is the period that we have. We're in the 5th century BC. Okay. 
Uh, at door, lots of products from the Greek world show up. So door is uh, about here, just a little bit north of, you just have to ignore Caesarea, which doesn't actually exist yet. Um, but, so, but so door is right about here in the, in the middle, southern middle of the, of the Levantine coast. And at the site um, have been found, for example, transport amphoras. These transport amphoras all were found at door. Uh, this is a transport amphora that comes from Athens, this from the island of Chios, and this from the island of Samos, here in the Greek world. So you can imagine merchants um, coming and going, purple dye from uh, the products here, very sought after. Murex shells only, only live in, in just this one area, in shallow bays. Um, in this part of the coast. So this is the only area where, you, where this sort of dye could be acquired in, um, in antiquity. Famous uh, passage about purple dyed textiles in the Agamemnon the, of Aeschylus, the play by Aeschylus. This is that period, 5th century BC. And, and that purple dye that was so coveted and was the mark of royalty um, and, and luxury and exotica in Athens comes from this, this area right here. It comes, comes from our part of the world. And in exchange, um, all sorts of commodities. So oil and wine being brought uh, from these islands in the, in the Greek world. And also fine tableware to, um, to mix and drink the wine at dinner parties. So mixing bowls and uh, cups for drinking and all sorts of other accoutrements, oil flasks or perfume jars, lamps, um, so that you could have fancy candlelight at your dinner party. Everybody could have a lamp by their, by their, ta by their place setting. Um, so, that, so attic tableware, tableware that was made in Athens, um, is not only extremely common here at Door, it's the only kind of tableware. There's no locally made tableware. So everybody had, this, was, this, this is not just oh, only a few people have access to this. Um, all the houses have examples of uh, attic bowls and cups and, and plates and lamps and so forth. Um, a very fascinating find um, from Door uh, is, is, is this, it's a cow scapula. <laughs> um, these scapulae uh, are known from, there's actually a couple have been found at Door, and, and they're known from, from other sites uh, uh, along the coast. The scapula itself um, is, is old. It's, it's some kind of gift or heirloom from at least a couple hundred years earlier. The scene that's carved on it uh, was carved in the late 8th or the 7th century. So these folks who look kind of like merchant Canaanite or you know merchant shippers and Canaanites, um, well that's or Phoenicians. That's because they are they're, they're from the Iron Age. But the scapula, in addition, has uh, an inscription that was added to it in the fifth century, and the lettering of the of the additional inscription is Cyprosyllabic. So it's uh, it's the native script of the island of of Cyprus. A few little letters were scratched on it, and you can imagine. Some merchant traveling between the coast and the Aegean, stopping at Cyprus and either acquiring or bartering for this unusual and exotic object that might have been found by accident by somebody living in an area where there was an earlier temple and uh, it had fallen into ruins and there were objects. And, uh, and scratching a little like Kilroy was here, sort of inscription on it, and then in turn bartering that for something else when, when, he, got to, uh, when he got to here. Because, the, because these incised um, scapulas are um, a find that regularly occurs at um, Philistine, in Philistine cult sites. Five of them, for example, were found in the Iron One um, buildings at Mykne, buildings 350 and 351. There were five decorated cow scapulae found there. So this is, uh, 
this is a little bit of the equivalent of you, you go to, I don't know, Stillwater and you buy some very old butter paddle that, that had some design etched on it, and then you bring it home, and then, you know, somebody else adds a little bit of something to it. It's like that kind of progression. Yeah. Um, the, first of all, I don't know for sure. It's likely that mostly what was in those vessels was wine and not olive oil. But it could have been olive oil, especially in the, ones for, in the one from Attica, because olive oil is a notable product of Athens. Um, Dor, there's not any production of olive oil at Dor. Uh, and... It's not, it's not necessarily the case that people from there would go to some other part of the country as opposed to just having a, mer a merchant who was, who was bringing things in um, bring it. But also, there's not any evidence in the Persian period for this kind of industrial size manufacturing of olive oil. That ends with, with the Babylonian conquest. Philistia, all of that olive oil manufacturing. So while the capability continues to exist, there's no evidence that the production and that quantity continued. How do we identify them? That's a very good question. Um, as a little piece of information that I uh, didn't tell you yet, um, is that we have a text about um, the political hegemony of this coast in this period in the 5th century. And uh, the, the kings of Sidon and Tyre, or the political units of Sidon and Tyre, the two um, Phoenician cities here, were granted hegemony over parts of this coast in a sort of checkerboard pattern. So the Sidonians had control of the area from Dor down to Jaffa, and the Tyrians had control of the area from Ashdod to Ashkelon. Um, and it, and so, so we know that politically uh, they were in charge of this zone. Of course, that doesn't answer what's probably your fundamental question, which is how are we allowed to identify them culturally. And that is, um, that is a question that has to do with, well, what would you mean by Phoenicians at this time? Part of it is um, the, uh, the continuation of religion, of religious practices in this area that has been Phoenician. Um, part of it is the way that people from outside, the Greeks, for example, refer to this area at this time. So it's referred to as Phoenician. And part of it has to do with um, artifacts of either script, you know, writing, or, um, or other doodahs, which in about five minutes you'll see some from Ashkelon, that continue to connect uh, these folks with Phoenician religious or cultural <coughs> ideas and beliefs. So we can't, we can't say, oh, everybody here is this, or all these people were the same. Absolutely not, and probably not, probably not at all. Um, but we can say that all of the evidence we have about political, religious, linguistic, and cultural affiliation are consistent with what we knew of from before and what we know of subsequent as Phoenician. So as a general moniker, I and most people continue to refer to this area as culturally Phoenicia. So, all right, so that's some, um, some of the remains of the Persian period from Dor. Let's take a look at Ashkelon. Ashkelon down here in the southern part of the coast. Unlike Dor, Ashkelon was a city that was one of the Philistine cities. It had its ebb and flow, just as Mykne did throughout the Iron Age. So in the most part of Iron II, uh, population was less, and the area of the city that was occupied contracted. And in the P 
period after the Assyrian conquest and before the Babylonians come through, uh, the city grew again in size and importance. It was crushed by the Babylonians. Here, unlike Dor, there is, as you saw at the beginning of the hour, uh, huge swaths of destruction debris found throughout the city. But immediately above that destruction debris, another very thriving settlement arises in in the period um, of the Persian period. Uh, Ashkelon is a huge city, and so excavation is very uh, helter or hopscotchy around, around the town. We don't have large um, areas that are open in any one zone. But here in this, uh, in this, this is grid 51 at Ashkelon, um, this, this big area that you see is partially eroded right into the Mediterranean. <coughs> Uh, is a, a shopping quarter, a, a warehouse and shopping quarter. There is a, um, what, what's, what's here called an administrative center. Scales and weights were found in here. And here, a storage facility um, called warehouse magazines where there were actually six um, 12 by 27 foot rooms, all of equivalent size. Uh, with a lot of goods found in the rooms, and each of the rooms had a concentration of the same sorts of goods, and a huge variety. So there was a room that was filled with uh, transport amphoras that are that that we call Phoenician. They're local to this part of the world, and they're local to the coast. They're called basket handled because the tops of the amphoras have two handles that are like, sort of like a tote bag, how you have two handles that come up on the top of a tote bag and then you can just pick it up. So that's the way that the handles are of, of these amphoras. So it was a whole, whole room filled with these. These would have been filled with olive oil or wine that would have gone out just the way some of these other goods were coming in. And this gets back in part to the question that you asked before. Um, so let me anticipate it and say, just as today, you know, wine is made in many states in this country, for example, California, Oregon, even Minnesota, and Wisconsin, believe it or not. Uh, and yet, you can buy French wine, German wine, Austrian wine, Australian wine. You know, you can buy wine from all sorts of other places because the, I mean, because people like that, because pe and people always have. People sometimes want to uh, support their local industry or can't afford to buy something else, and sometimes they can or they like it better. That's what they, that's what they want, or in some respects, it's... Uh, um, a sort of trade, I like what you have, you like what I have, we'll, we'll swap. So this is a period where you can see all of a sudden that exact same kind of market system at work. You find the vessels that represent that kind of very lively commercial exchange. Um, Phoenician transport amphora are found in the Aegean and Aegean amphoras are found in the Levant. Um, also, attic pottery here, for example, a very adorable red figure attic cup, drinking cup, with its cute little owl, the symbol of Athens, found in Ashkelon. Whole series of drinking cups from, from Athens and other vessels. All sorts of exotic doodahs. So here, um, a gilded bronze Osiris amulet. You see its little its little link here at the bottom so that you could have had it as a, on, a, on the end of a charm necklace or a charm bracelet. Uh, you might want to think of it as evidence that somebody here believed in the Egyptian deity Osiris, but you could also think of it as a travel knickknack. And there's, considering that was found inside the, the warehouse area, that's, that's more likely. A whole series of um, amulets of this strange design, a triangular bottom, horizontal uh, crossbar, and then a circle on the top. This is a symbol that we know means, stands in for, a Phoenician deity. And her name is Tanit. She is uh, a fertility deity, sort of in the general realm of Elat and Balat and Astarte, yet another one. And if you think that that's weird to have a whole bunch of female deities that whose spheres overlap, you only have to think about Artemis, Aphrodite, Athena, Hera, 
mean, there's, there's, there are plenty of cosmologies with room for lots of overlapping deity functions. So um, Tanit is just another one of those. This symbol, this Tanit symbol, is one that will come back. But this is the one that I was referring to when I said in a few minutes we'll see something else. So um, there are actually bunches, bunches of these. So these were very popular to have um, in, in the town of Ashkelon. Above the area of the warehouse, all of a sudden, in the middle of the 5th century, in about the year 450, this is really weird and one of the weirdest things that's ever been found in Israel, um, the whole area of the warehouse was covered over and used as a dog cemetery, or a little bit more precisely, a puppy cemetery. Here you see one of those animals, and here uh, a plan. Over 700 dog burials occur here. Um, here's some facts about the dog cemetery. The dogs are all the same type. They are about, they would have been, when alive and standing, about 20 inches high and about 30 pounds. And their closest modern analog as a Bedouin sheepdog, a sort of little fast wiry guy. About 60 to 70 percent of the dogs are puppies, and lest you think that that indicates something horrifying about um, the practice of getting rid of animals, that is actually identical to the modern urban population. So in other words, there's no reason to suspect foul play. There are no butchering marks on any of the bones. As you can see from the burials, the dogs are actually, they're not just dumped in, they're laid in a grave. Each animal laid carefully in a grave, the tail tucked in between the legs. Look at this. Here's the tail. Tucked in between the legs. They are not mummified. There are no grave gifts. And there are no markers. So many of the burials superpose other burials. Because once a dog was put inside one of these shallow pits and, and the dirt was mounded over and then it was flattened down, you didn't necessarily know that there was a burial right there. So then when the next dog was going to be buried, you might dig into part of the area where there was an earlier burial. And that was obviously OK. So there are no markers. So, this is kind of mystifying. Uh, what's going on? Well, it's probably not a cemetery, because if it was a cemetery, there would be markers, and you wouldn't have these superposed burials. And there, there might even be gifts, or the occasional something, but there is nothing. It doesn't have anything to do with Egyptian cult. That is the first thing that you might think is a logical explanation. Because everybody knows that the Egyptians had a thing for animals and um, making animals the kind of stand in for some of their deities. But in that case, the animals that would have been used in cult or allowed to roam around in the temple of a deity with which they were associated, when they died, they were mummified. We have mummified cats, alligators, all sorts of weird animals mummified from Egypt. But none of these are mummified. So it probably doesn't have anything to do with Egyptian cult. They aren't food because there are no butchering marks. And all the bones are there. This is not, actually not the only place where a dog cemetery has been found, although it is the biggest. There um, is a smaller dog cemetery at um, Ashdod, Kassile, and the modern Lebanese city of Byblos, ancient Byblos which is north of Sidon in, in modern Lebanon today. So what is it? Um, there is some circumstantial evidence that dogs were uh, ad, not only admired by uh, Phoenicians of this period, but considered the um, considered stand-ins for a magical kind of healing. And there are dogs referred to in conjunction with 
uh, cult of a healing deity, a Phoenician healing deity on Cyprus. Possibly because, as anybody who's ever had a dog knows, when a dog hurts themselves, hurts him or herself, they can just lick the, they can. They, they lick themselves, you know, they, they'll lick whatever hurts if they have a, anything that's, uh, they'll lick it and, and, and it will get better. Well, may, I mean, maybe it would have gotten better all by itself. But this was very impressive, uh, apparently, at one point in time to these folks. And so for a little while, dogs who were probably essentially wild, I mean, this, the dogs that were wandering around, um, were thought of as the, the stand-ins for or... Um, connected in some way with this Phoenician healing deity, and so were accorded special status when they died. The dog cemetery lasts for, um, I don't know, about two generations, about 80 years or so. And, uh, and then it's covered over and, and more, more buildings are, are built on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was digging in Israel when um, I, I dig in Israel most summers, and I was I happened to be in the field when the when the first dogs at the dog cemetery at Ashkelon were found. And of course, at the time that they found them, the Ashkelon excavators had no idea that they were going to encounter over 700 of these things. And they're very painstaking to excavate because the whole dog is there, and you have to very carefully clear away the dirt. When they found the first one, they were you know everybody on, on excavations in Israel the summer hears about things that are being found in other places, and so you know we heard. You know, they found something really interesting down at Ashkel, and they, they found um, th these dog burials, and we were all interested, and, you know, people were hearing about it. And so for the first few days and the first week, it was really big. Oh, they found another. Did you hear they found another dog at Ashkel? Did, did you hear they found more dogs at Ashkel? <laughs> you know what? The entire season at Ashkel has been turned over to excavating dogs. You know, you'd be, see people who would be at Ashkel that summer. Would you do this summer? Well, <laughs> Excavated ten dog skeletons, and after one, two max, you're like, okay, I, I get it. <laughs> Do I really have to keep going now? <laughs> oh man! But they were very good. They excavated them all. Yeah, Tom. In the New Testament, I think they Guess so. Of course, that's 500 years later. Tom, Tom remarks that in the New Testament, there's, there, n there's nothing good to be said about dogs, or very little. <coughs> of course, you know, a lot of the incidents that happen um, in, some of the, in, in some of the Gospels are, are urban. They happen in, in towns and settled areas. And if you have wild dogs in towns and settled areas, they're trouble. So yeah, that's the difference. Was there another hand back up here someplace? Um, all right, we have five minutes, so we're going to start uh, with, the, um, with the other part of the country in this period, and that is the, the area of the interior. So we've looked at places on the coast, Dor, um, remains from the Sharon Plain, Ashkelon, and the image is a very busy, lively, commercially vibrant, um, economically... Uh, stable area. Jerusalem, of course, suffered terribly in the Babylonian conquest. But with the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus, the fortunes of the peoples who had been exiled to Babylon changed almost at once. The first biblical book after the story of the destruction of the temple is the book of Ezra. And the opening of the book of Ezra, Ezra 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. 
and the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, with free will offerings for the temple of God. This is an amazing event. The exiles, some of whom, of the people who are living in Babylon, are the same people who had been exiled. I mean, children who had, who had left Jerusalem with the conquest of Nebuchadnezzar in 586 were now old men in Babylon. And after Cyrus's conquest, he says to this group of people, go home and rebuild. Now the Jews, the Judites, I shouldn't really call them Jews. They're not really Jews yet. The Judites, um, are not the only peoples that had been exiled who are given permission and support for returning. The Assyrians and the Babylonians had had as imperial policy the moving around of large chunks of people, large groups of people. So there are many other peoples that had been conquered, who had been moved, who are allowed to return home. We know it because we have inscriptions and uh, mostly inscriptions um, from some of these other places. It's only the Judeans who write a big book about it. Nobody else writes a big book. Uh, other people record the beneficence of Cyrus, the king of Persia, but the Judeans make a major story out of it, and that major story is the book of Ezra, the biblical book of Ezra. And um, indeed, um, on, I actually think I have the exact date here. I think it's March. Yeah, March 10th. March 10th, 515 BCE. Uh, the temple that the Judeans are allowed to return and rebuild is rededicated on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And with that date, March 10th, 515, the period of the second temple begins. Well, that's a very interesting question. This text that you've got up here, this, of course, is an English translation from the book of Ezra. It's an English translation, but parts of this are in Aramaic, and parts of it are in Hebrew. So the book starts in Hebrew in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. This verse, verse 1, is in Hebrew, but this verse, verse 2, is in Aramaic. And it looks to be... I mean, and there's a lot of scholarship about this. But, but anyway, there are, in both in the book of Ezra and in the book that comes after, the book of Nehemiah, sections that purport to be quotes from imperial Persian documents. And those sections are in the language of the Persian court. They're not in the language of the people who, who are living here. Um, and this lends credibility to the idea that whoever was writing this had access to those documents. And, and they can form in their language, in the formulas of their language, um, in their grammar and everything, two other imperial Persian documents. They are precisely the same. Well, well, that is, an, of course, a very good question. Exactly when was the Book of Ezra written? And we don't know exactly when the Book of Ezra was written. Um, but, but most biblical scholars believe that it was written at some point in the 5th or the 4th century BC. So not identical to the time that is being talked about, but quite close which doesn't absolve you from thinking about the issues that we talked about in discussion last time. Um, even if it was written at the exact same time as the events, it wouldn't absolve you from, from thinking about that issue. Uh, but the time, it's much less than the 500 years that separate, for example, the story of David and Goliath and the writing down of the story in, in the book of Samuel. All right, see you guys next time.